Buenos días, Kaleo Church. And happy Sabbath. You all have trained me well. I know what to say. It is a joy to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And it is a privilege to be with you all again. If some of you may or may not remember me, the last time that I was here in this house of God was last December. And I was really happy to join you back then. And I'm so honored that Pastor Manny invited me to come back again. That's always a good sign, you know, when they invite you back. It's a good sign. And I'm very, very grateful to my brother and Pastor Manny. Uh, I love that you all have invited me to come back into this sermon series that you have been doing, Café con Fe. I don't know where the café is this morning, uh, but I am excited to be here to talk about Café con Fe and celebrating Latin American faith to finish off, I think I'm finishing off the Hispanic Heritage Month series. And I love that Pastor Manny has been in... um, the past three sermons, he's been talking about being uh, Jesus as a Galilean mestizo, being in, in this life that is called the hyphenated life, the in-between spaces, in-between spaces kind of life. I love that he has been talking about a Cristo in every room. And then lastly, he was talking about la lucha in Joshua's story, in the story of the people of Israel, in the stones of remembrance that was that were passed down through the generations. I love that you all have been discussing that and thinking and reflecting upon that. So what I bring you this morning is what this noon is I would like to talk about the named and unnamed women in the seen and unseen spaces of faith. The named and unnamed women in seen and unseen spaces of faith, specifically in the second letter of Paul to his beloved child, Timothy. So if you can open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. That's going to be the main text today where we will be in. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We will be there and jumping around in a few other places. But I would like for us to, for me to read over you these words of God our Father. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God. Paul says, whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did. When I remember you, Timothy, constantly in my prayers, night and day, I am praying for you, Timothy. Recalling your tears, Timothy, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith, listen to this, a faith that lived first in your abuela, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you, Timothy. For this reason, for this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let, let us pray. Señor y Padre Celestial, te damos gracias en este día. Te, te damos gracias en este Sabbath because your presence is here in this place. God, Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place. We know that you already have been ushered into this place. We invite you that the same spirit of power and love and self-discipline would be here in this place. Would you give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you and a heart to know you? And give us eyes to see us and ears to see ourselves and a heart to know ourselves more, God. God, I pray that you would illumine this text, that as we jump into this text, as what does it look like to live a life of faith? Would you open our eyes and give us eyes to see, give us faith eyes, and would you faith our eyes? Would you make that faith noun into a verb, God? Speak to us today. Your children are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So we see here that Paul is speaking to Timothy, who is his beloved child. Paul is not really Timothy's biological father, but he is filling a void like a father. What we know about Timothy is that Timothy is a biracial child. He is a mestizo. He's half and half, kind of like me. I have a Spanish mother and a Nicaraguan father. Timothy is very similar. His father was Greek and his mother was a Jew, was Jewish. So we don't know what the name of his father is, but we do know the name of his mother and grandmother. And I find it really interesting that as Paul is writing to Timothy in the latter days of, of, of his ministry, we know that this is Paul's last letter that he ever writes. Isn't it amazing that his first letters he's writing to the church in Corinth, and he writes several letters to Corinth. He writes to the church in Rome, which we have the letter to the Romans. He's writing to a lot of churches, but in the latter days of his life, he writes to this one son, his spiritual son, and this is his last letter. So these are his last words, and this is what he highlights. Paul is writing to his beloved uh, son, Timothy, a spiritual child. And in verse three, we see that Paul is grateful, is grateful uh, about to God and says, whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did. And he's about to name some of Timothy's ancestors. So he is remembering the ancestors and how these with joy. And Paul must know some information about Peter's life, Peter, Timothy's life, because he knows who his mama is and who his grandmama is. He knows his mama and he knows his abuela. I wonder if they had sat together to talk before. I wonder if they had uh, broken bread at the table before. And in verse uh, three, he says, I'm reminded, very important here, in verse five, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived or dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. Timothy's faith is praised, but so is his mother's, and so is his grandmother's. He is saying that this, fa this faith, in my Spanish Bible, it says it's not feigned, it's not fake. It's not fake faith. So Paul is praising Timothy's faith that first was in his abuela, and then his mother, and then in him. So you see this generational faith that is happening, that is coming down, that is flowing like a river into Timothy's life. And he says that first it dwelt in his abuela. And then after it dwelt in his abuela, it was passed down like a river into his mother. And after his mother Eunice passed it down to Timothy. So what is this kind of faith and what does it, does it look like for Timothy, this, this mestizo child who is a church a pastor? What does it mean for him to have been impacted by his abuela and mother? I think it's like having uh, faith like rice. I am sure that many of you have cooked rice before, and if you were not prepared to cook rice today, I don't have a fire, but we're going to pretend that we have a fire today. So to me, this faith as being passed down from uh, the abuela to the mother to Timothy, it reminds me of, of when I was learning to cook rice. How many of you have cooked rice before? Many. Okay. So those of you who raised our hands, this is your test. Now you're like, I wish I had not raised my hands because I don't know what this woman is doing up here. But um, I have here a cup of rice. And when I was a young girl, a preteen, I was in my grandmother's house. I was in my grandmother's house and my tia Sela uh, asked me a question that I didn't know I went to a test that day. But she said, Ines, how many times do you wash rice? So when you don't know the answer to a question, you, don't, you use your deductive reasoning skills that the answer is probably no. Because if the question says, how many times do you wash rice before you cook it? You assume that you have to wash the rice, right? Am I right? Okay. So... I'm thinking kind of quickly, and she's got her hikaro spoon here, her hikaro bowl, and I'm thinking, okay, you got to wash rice, I guess, but I don't know what the answer is. And I said, one? She said, three. I was like, well, I, I guess I missed that day in school when they were teaching me how to cook rice, right? So here I am in my abuela's house, and my tia is teaching me how to wash rice. 
And then she says, and for every cup of rice, how much water? Oh, my God. So you know you have to use water. So anybody here want to tell me what your rice recipe is for every cup of rice? How much water? Two. I got some twos. I hear twos. Anybody else different than two? Who? Anybody say one? No. Nobody? Nobody says one? Nobody says one? So I said two also, and she said 1.5. Come on, tia. Que pasa? <laughs> 1.5. She's very precise. And so she's washing the rice. I failed the washing of the rice. I failed the water to rice ratio. But oh my goodness, what do you do? That's what you're learning that day. That's kind of what reminded me that it, it, that's what's happened between uh, Timothy's abuela and mother, they're, he's pa they're passing down important information. Like if you're going to be Nicaraguan and you're going to be your, your grandmother's granddaughter, you better know how to cook rice, right? So it's 1.5. I will never forget. I have never failed that test again. So 1.5, okay. And that is one of many things that may be, that may be grandmother, la abuela y la mamá were passing down to Timothy. This, this, these knowledge of what is life and what is light and what is power and what is faith. For this reason, verse 6, and before you think we're just talking about rice this morning, hold on to this information because it's going to become relevant in a minute. We're not just cooking rice today. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God, Timothy. For this reason, for the reason that I just reminded you that your abuela and your mother were passing down these, these, this knowledge of power, this knowledge of faith. They were depositing in you these seeds of rice in you. For this reason, he says, Paul says, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give you, Timothy, a spirit of cowardice. But rather, Timothy, a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. For this reason, because of the faith of your abuela and the faith of your mama, the faith of your mother, they deposited in you a seed, Timothy, a seed of knowledge, a fruit-bearing seed, not just any seed. And Paul says, then fan the flame of the gift of God. Just like your abuela, she was no coward. Just like your mama, she was no coward. They had faith. And what is this knowledge of faith and power of God? I feel like Paul is almost saying that they were not cowards and neither are you. I don't know what was happening in Timothy's life, but he was encouraging Timothy that he was not given a spirit of cowardice. Not like his abuela, not, not, not like them. That they were not like that. Just like these mujeres, with the help of the Holy Spirit, verse 14 says, with the help of the Holy Spirit, verse 13 and 14, hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me, from Paul, in the faith and love that is in Christ Jesus. This faith was in Christ Jesus. This love was in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. And before you think my grandmother and my tias were just teaching me how to cook rice, which is really important to know, by the way, um, let me tell you a story about faith like rice. So this tia that was testing me that day uh, was, in, uh, was about 14 or 15 years old one day, and she was at a, at a church event in Nicaragua where all the women of our church had cooked a big meal for a pastor's conference. And... They had cooked a big meal for a pastor's conference, and my, my tia was there helping. She was about 14 or 16 years old. And they had cooked a much bigger pot of rice than this one that I have here. I mean, it was, I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're like th this wide and deep, like you need an extra special long wooden spoon to stir that rice. And now you know the right water to rice ratio, okay? So you can imagine how hard it is cooking that much rice. And so they're, they're cooking this rice for a pastor's conference and they, and they take off the cover and they see, <gasps> se pegó el arroz. Ooh. You know what that means. When the rice sticks 
¡Ay, ay, 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 ay! No, 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 no. ¿Qué vamos a hacer? ¡Qué vergüenza! Se pegó el arroz. The rice is stuck. And again, you didn't get the water to, to rice ratio. And it's stuck at the bottom. And not just stuck at the bottom, but also at the top. It hadn't cooked well, so it was clumpy. I don't know how you like to cook your rice, but in Nicaragua, the rice is supposed to be smooth when you lift it up. It's supposed to fall. You should see every grain falling. And it was clumpy. That's bad rice, according to my abuela. That's bad rice. So my tia Sela is like, well, what can we do? The, the rice is stuck. So those women in the kitchen said, hermanos, what are we going to do for the rice? And she, she, in that moment, she said, it felt so ridiculous. It felt so crazy that we're going to pray for the rice. Just start serving those, those plates and sending them out, right? The people are about to come and eat, but they decided to cover, cover the rice pot, hold hands, and pray. And she said, to her surprise, you would not believe that after they had a powerful time of prayer, they took off the cover, they stuck in the big spoons, and the rice was not stuck anymore. She could not believe it. She thought, who are these women? What, what kind of woman prays over the rice? Right? But you know, we're like a shame-based culture, so no puede haber arroz pegado. Right? We're not going to serve that rice in this big pot. She could not believe her eyes. And she said, Ines, I don't know that I had faith to pray over a rice like that. I don't know that I had that type of faith. So when I think about this, I, 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 I often think about this prayer and my rice has stuck before, but I haven't had the courage to pray over my rice in my own kitchen. But when I think about this, I think that these women, they must have known something that I didn't know. Our abuelas and our tías and our mamás, they must have known that the power was not in the pot of their circumstances, but only in Christ. That the power was not on, on how clumpy and stuck and, and, and hopeless it looked like. They knew that the power of God was not in that, and that's not where life was, but that God had the power. That the power of prayer was the place of power. That the pot of rice was not their hope, but the resurrected Christ was. Not the pot of rice, the resurrected Christ. They knew how to tap into that power. And they were teaching those things from generation to generation as they labored in the kitchen. They weren't just cooking rice. They know that you, they knew that you can do everything right, add the right amount of water, saute the right amount of onions, wash the rice and add the salt, and still things may not work out the way you wanted them to be. So what do you do? What kind of, what kind of faith is the kind of faith that you have when things don't go well? What kind of faith do you have when you're in crisis or, or trials? My tia Sela knew that prayer was not the last resort, but the first resort. That prayer, that the power of prayer requires dwelling in the presence of God. Oh, and these women dwelt in the presence of God. When we started this morning, or at, right at noon, we were singing some songs, and Sister Jenny said, I'm going to go pray for you. And I thought, the music just started. Like, you want me to step outside and pray? Uh, like, there's no time right now to pray, but I mean, you can pray for me right now. And she said, no, we're going we're gonna to go outside and pray. Just follow me. And that's exactly what we did because that's the first thing we do. That's where the power of God is, in the presence of God. And they prayed for me, and I know that they continue to pray through the service, which is something that's near and dear to my heart. The power of prayer requires dwelling in the presence of God. The power is not what's happening in our circumstances, um, but in the resurrected Christ. Who else are these Who are these other women in scripture that we see that are women of faith? Who are these other women? I think of Lydia in the, in the book of Acts, in Acts 16. In Acts 16, I'm not going to read all of this, but in verses 11 through uh, 15, we see that Paul and Silas are traveling to Philippi. And on, a, on the Sabbath day, so on a day like today, on the Sabbath day, they went outside by the river to pray. You see, there was no uh, synagogue in Philippi. And in order to have a synagogue in, in Philippi or a synagogue anywhere, you needed at least 10 righteous Jewish men. So there was no synagogue because they couldn't even find 10 righteous Jewish men. Lydia and her friends said, no synagogue, no problem. On the Sabbath day, we go by the river to pray. And that's where Paul and Silas finds these women 
at the place of prayer, they sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. Can you imagine their stories as they're praying and praising and praising and praying? That is where the power was, not in a building that actually was not even there, but the power was by the river praying. And Lydia, who was a worshiper of God, she was a businesswoman. She was a dealer in purple cloth, verse 14 says. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. And she and her household were baptized. Her whole household was baptized. We know later on that Lydia becomes the house church leader in Philippi. And we know later on that it had not been for Lydia and the women that were praying by the river, we wouldn't have the book of Philippians today. Did you know that? Because this is where the church started, in, by the river, not in the river, by the river. That's where the praying was happening. That's where faithful women were praying. And I, am, I admire that, that these women were leaving a legacy so we wouldn't have the book of Philippians if these women had not been doing the ministry of prayer. And not only that, the church in Philippi became the strongest supporter of Paul's missionary journeys. Did you know that? They sent offerings to him and sent a friend to him when Paul was a prisoner in Rome. So we, they, we, we see the witness of women, the witness of Lydia in Acts 16. What about Matthew chapter 1? See, in Matthew chapter 1, we see the legacy and the, the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. See, in, in back in those days, the legacies and the genealogies did not include the names of women. So who are these five women that we see in the genealogy of Jesus? What is the Holy Spirit doing? What is he trying to say when he mentions the women like Tamar, the Canaanite, and Rahab, another Canaanite, and Ruth, and Bathsheba, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. In this long genealogy of the ancestors, of the abuelas, and the mothers, and the tias of Jesus, we see these women, and we say their names, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Luke chapter 8, Verses 1 through 3, I love this section. It says, soon afterwards, Jesus went through the cities and the villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. So here is Jesus proclaiming the news of the kingdom of God. The 12 uh, men were with him. But listen up. As well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. So we have these names of the female disciples of Jesus that were also in Jesus' group, right? They were in Jesus' group, like Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and the word there, many others, in the original language is actually female, it's feminine. And so many other women were also following Jesus. Jesus had a group of faithful women and men. And these women say that, the, the text says that they were providing for the ministry out of their resources. I just love that women have always been bankrolling the ministry of Jesus. Amen? They were always right there providing. So we see the women in Matthew, in the genealogy of Matthew. We see the women like Lydia by the river. We see these, the, the female disciples of Jesus and many others. We see the legacy of faith, the legacy of faith that would not be the same without the women who followed Jesus. The lineage of Jesus would not be the same without women in their ministry. The lineage of Timothy and the faith of Timothy would not be the same without his abuela and mother. The lineage of Kaleo Church would not be the same with your women and your mothers and your tias and your abuelas y bisabuelas y tatarabuelas without those grandmothers and great-grandmothers and great-great-grandmothers. It is a faith that's been forged in the fire. Don't you know it? I bet each and every one of you has a story that you could say, if it hadn't been for the Lord, my rice would have stuck. If it hadn't been for the Lord, when my rice stuck and I prayed this situation in my life, if it hadn't been for the Lord, where would I be? If it hadn't been for the Lord. 
This is the kind of faith that gets stronger in the face of fire. This is the kind of faith that's not just feeding bodies, but also feeding souls. This is the kind of fruit-bearing faith. Faith that bears fruit, and then more fruit, and then great fruit. Don't underestimate the faith of these women. The faith of Latin American women in our lives as well. I mentioned earlier that uh, my mother died when I was actually 11 years old. She died in an airplane accident, and I became an orphan immediately. And my father went through a, a deep, deep depression. And that deep depression, um, it just completely took him out for about a year. So my grandmother came to live with us, and my tias, I had two, they also took me under their wings. I was the only girl in the middle of eight boys, and so they took me, they treated me like a princess, you know, because they didn't have little girls. And it was through the faith of my grandmother. It was through the presence of my grandmother that I knew God loved me, that God had not abandoned me, that even though in my loss and in, 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 in that void in my life, God was with me porque mi abuela was with me, right? It was my grandmother who taught me how to pray. It was my grandmother who taught me how to make rice and my tias as well. It was my grandmother who taught me how to read the Bible. It was my grandmother who taught me how to read, to memorize Psalm 121. And she made me read it every morning before I got on the bus. She was depositing the faith, her faith into my heart. And today it is bearing fruit today. Today, that's what is happening. The faith of Latina women, I think, is faith like rice. The faith of Latina women is, the, is that kind of faith that bears fruit that will continue for generations. Because we know that rice cooks under pressure. You have to cover it up. Have you ever gotten into a house and someone's cooking and you want to, you don't, you don't uncover the rice because you'll, you'll get in trouble, won't you? You will get in trouble because rice has to cook under pressure. So it is with faith. So it is with faith. It needs fire, it needs pressure, it needs steam. And that's the kind of faith of our grandmothers. It is spirit spoken. It is spirit sent. It is spirit sustained in the trials of the fire. It is foundational for individuals like Timothy. And it is foundational, foundational for churches like Philippi that started in Lydia's house. So we stand on the shoulders of those type of women. We stand on the shoulders of my abuela, Sara, and my, who is no longer with us. She is with the Lord right now and with my mother. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of my tia, Sela, and, and my tia, Sara. We stand on the shoulders of other women that I know about, like Dr. Elizabeth Conde Frazier, who is the dean of Esperanza College, a beautiful Latina theologian, brilliant in her mind. We stand on the shoulder of Dr. Lisette Rojas Flores, who is a clinical psychologist at the School of Psychology and in Fuller Theological Seminary. We stand on the shoulders of Dolores Huerta, who fought for farm workers' rights on this very soldier so soil. We stand on her shoulders and we say with her, si se puede. She is the one that coined the, the phrase, si se puede. We stand on the shoulders of Nora Lozano, the first Latina theologian professor in San Antonio, Texas. We stand on the shoulders of the Dr. Reverend Alexia Salvatierra, who's been working for 40 years with a sanctuary movement, working for decades to help the immigrant community in the United States and abroad. We stand on the shoulders of my friend, Pastora Jennifer Guerra Aldana, co-pastor of La Fuente Ministries, a Nazarene church just down here in Sierra Madre. We stand on all those shoulders, and we stand on the shoulders of your women, too. See, I follow you all on, on, on Instagram, and so I kind of know what's happening. And we stand on the, on the shoulders of uh, my sister, Jasmine Arreola. Are you here today? I don't know. But I saw that Jasmine is one of the Sabbath school teachers here at Caleo. We stand on the shoulders of all the Sabbath school teachers, men and women, who are serving here to deposit this faith that is like rice. Depositing that recipe of faith that knows trials and tribulations. We stand on those shoulders right now. And so I want to honor what God is doing through the ministry of women today. And I'd like to invite all the Sabbath school teachers to stand up men or women, all the volunteers, if whether you serve with the children, whether you serve in worship, whether you serve in praying in the back, if you are helping and serving in this church, I'd like to invite you to stand up because I want to pray for you as we finish off. 
And I want to pray for those of you who are sitting too, that you would have faith like rice, that you would have arroz con fe, that you would have this legacy that just like Paul told Timothy and Timothy, the things that you learned from your grandmother, the things that you learned from your mother, the things that you have learned from me, pass it down. Pass down the recipe, Timothy. What's the recipe of faith? What did it look like for you? Maybe you do two cups of, ri of water per rice. Maybe you do one and a half. It doesn't matter. Pass down the recipe. In chapter 2, verse 2, it says that he should pass down this legacy of faith to faithful men and women that in turn will teach it unto others. To faithful men and women, chapter 2, verse 2, that in turn will teach it unto others. And that is you. So even though you're not standing right now, I'm going to invite you to stand. So if you're sitting, if you'll stand, please. We're going to finish off with this, with this prayer. Second Timothy 2. You then here at Kaleo Church. You then, daughter who are standing, you then, child, Christ Jesus. Don't be strong in your grace. Don't be strong in how the rice turned out. Don't be strong in whether it turned out good or turned out stuck. Don't be strong in that. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me, what you have received from your abuelas, what you have received from your Sabbath school teachers, what you have received from your fathers and tias and uncles, in the presence of these cloud of witnesses, the faith that you have received and the grace that you have experienced, do this. This is a strong word. Entrust. Entrust this grace to faithful women and men who will be able to teach others as well. Entrust it. Give them your rice recipe and give them your tears recipe. Give them your faith under trial and your faith forged in the fire. Give it to them. Share in the sufferings like a good soldier of Christ Jesus, Timothy. And I say the same to you, and it is a prayer for Kaleo Church. Kaleo, be strong in the, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Have this kind of faith that is sticky like rice. Have this kind of faith. Oh God, we worship you today. You have given us a grace and you have given us in Christ Jesus a provision and a means of grace. And God, we honor the sisters and mothers, the fathers and the abuelas and the abuelos and the friends. We honor the children that are being held right now, that they too would be entrusted with this grace. Help us to tell our stories, God. Help us to celebrate the grace of you, that, that we would make much of your grace through our, our stories. And we, may we story tell, may we tell our children what you have done in us. May we not trust the pot of rice, but may we trust the resurrected Christ. May it be foundational for this church and for generations to come in our homes, in our families, in our communities, in this church, in every, every ministry in this church. We bless it with this grace. I hope that there will just be tons and tons of rice just falling all over every ministry here. That we would have faith like sticky rice. God, we honor you. We make much of your name. We make much of your grace because your name is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue can confess that you are the only Lord of salvation. You give life and you give light and there is power in your name. Oh God, we thank you for this grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.